it's the next level. I know you think you've stalemated us, but we still have moves, don't we, Alex? We can apply the brakes, slow to a crawl, choke out your power, and shut down your systems. And yours. My crew know life below zero. We've run a lot of rough miles together. Snowpiercer will tear herself apart. It's a hell of a test for a leader when the lights go out and the food stops flowing. How long do you think this uh, Mr. Layton will last? I think he might surprise you. I guess I'd better meet him then. Welcome back to the show, panelers. I'm Steve. And I'm Kat. That's right. This week we are joined by the lovely Kat. And uh, thank you so much, Kat, for joining me for this discussion of Snowpiercer Season 2, Episode 2. Before we get started, just so everybody is clear and knows what's going on, this will be a spoilerful podcast for Snowpiercer Season 2, Episode 2, Smolder to Life. And I was a little concerned when I put this in the doc because for some reason... Uh, the INDB title has smolder spelled with a U, but yet every time they said smolder in the show, there was no U in it. So I don't know which is the correct spelling. It's not underlined on the doc, so I guess it can be spelled both ways. It must be one of those weird words that you yeah. can spell. So Well, and Steve, no one can see the doc, so they wouldn't know how you spelled it. It's true. Way. That's why I have to tell them. I have to tell them these little oh. details because they, they don't see the doc. See? So oh, of course. <laughs> but it is. How did I miss that? <laughs> So a uh, quick synopsis for this episode uh, for this episode was an exchange is made between the two trains, but a greater revelation might be just over the horizon. So what did you think of this episode, Kat? I, I liked it. Uh, there were some uncomfortable bits to it <laughs> <laughs> that I was warned about, but still was not ready for. But I like it. I really, you know how much I like this, the story in this program. But they seem that they can just put so much story in one episode and do it so well. Other shows and other producers or, or directors might stretch this out. This could have been three episodes. Absolutely. I was I was really amazed that we, we get the confirmation. I think this is down in my notes, but I'm going to say it now. We get the confirmation that the world is coming back to life right away, right here in episode two. And I was, I was really surprised that we got that for sure for them going, yes, this is actually happening. But I understand because they're setting up for the entire season. And uh, it's it's going to be interesting going forward to see how we we deal with these two trains and how we deal with this research station and setting up these pockets of whatever they're going to try to do to set up pockets mm -hmm. of civilization. Mm -hmm. How long it's actually going to take, you know, that's that's the big question, I think. Yeah. And well, the way they have handled this and the way they move through the story in the first season, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people were worried it was just going to be a detective on a train story. Right. But I have faith that they're going to do this and do it well with all three locations or both trains and the station. Yeah. And we're, we're back to kind of a, we've got another mystery and a new detective and I'm sure we'll be yeah. talking a little bit about that as we, uh, we go through our, our top five kind of discussion points. So as I'm a gentleman, I will let the lady go first. And uh, what was your first uh, point of discussion? I, I have such a hard time pulling out all of the different things in right. what order. <laughs> I guess the first thing I have here is just, getting slapped in the face with how ruthless and sadistic but still charismatic that Mr. Wilford is. You know, we're learning more about him. Sean Bean's doing a great job. But boy, whew, we did get to learn more about what goes on uh, on that train and Big Alice and some of the things they've been doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'll, I'll re, I'll re kind of refigure some of mine because Mr. Wilford was my, my, uh, one of mine as well. And it, it's just, it's, it's just amazing how he's got this very calculating way about him, but he's definitely, it's definitely a cult leader kind of vibe. And we can see that even there's still, there's people, even though it's been whatever they say, 17 years, seven years, seven years, I'm sorry. Yeah. Seven years since they've actually seen Mr. Wilford, but yet 
they're still holding up his little salute thing. He has this this subtle way of trying to undermine Leighton. He keeps calling him king during the, mm-hmm. the prisoner exchange. And, you know, he's not doing he's doing that as a dig at Leighton, but he's also trying to put that in the ear of the people around him. Yes. You know, yes, he's trying to get under his skin and he wants uh, his followers to see him differently. You know, and even in that tea car, you, when you bring out how the people see him, they mm-hmm. haven't seen him for seven years. They literally have a shrine to him yeah. in that, you know, religious tea car. Yeah. It has a teacup in it. Yeah. Yeah. And they were, which, which character was it? I don't remember now if it was Till or one of the other ones that said half the people think he's here to save us and half the people think he's here to destroy us or something, something like that. So it's, it's really interesting. And then, you know, we got Miss Audrey in the last episode, I think, or it might've been this episode saying something like he wants their souls, you know, and it, and then you already kind of brought up a little bit the super creepy bathtub scene with with kevin and and it's just that kind of way he gets kevin to commit suicide right there in front of him and then the dog with the oh it was just yeah it was just creepy and he's just sitting there and alex is listening to her music with her back to them and it just the whole scene just made me cringe oh yeah Uh, but i had to watch it through my fingers because I was, I just wanted to see Bean's face, you know, Mr. Mm-hmm. Wilford's face, but I couldn't see what else was going on because I knew what was coming. Yeah, I yeah. just, yeah, it was pretty, pretty, uh, not and, pretty. It was pretty, not pretty. Right, right, right. So it just, uh, just amazing. So we both kind of had that same first. So what's, what's another one of yours? Well, I guess with that one, uh, it's how he is grooming Alex to be the same. He was a mentor to Melanie, mm-hmm. and it's obvious he's doing the same thing with Alex, but. He is really doing a pretty good job of of turning her a different way. I don't think she's as altruistic as Melanie. Right. I mean, you know, Melanie is trying to save the world on her arc. And Wilfred's just out for himself. And he's doing experiments uh, that are not as kind. I mean, I think that's coming down the line with what we've seen they've been doing with the science. Yeah. And it, it seems like with Alex, it seems weird that it seems like every every time we she starts to get a glimpse of Melanie as her mother and we, we kind of think Alex might be sort of softening a little bit, then it, it quickly turns, you know, and because right. she's she's been so like you said, she's been so ba- uh, brainwashed by Mr. Wilford that her mother is this terrible, horrible person who left her behind and that she just keeps going back to that. And I, and I hope they find a way to to kind of bridge that throughout the season. Would it be different though if instead of the traditional she turns around, loves her mother, all those kind of things storyline that we kind of expect if she just ended up being another Wilford? Oh, see, <laughs> I I get He's grooming her for that. We, I mean, Melanie, her mom even describes her as cruel. Yeah. Yeah, I, Leighton asks how she is, and she, she just flat out said she's cruel. I would be so depressed if that happened. I, I, you know, I like shows that have some positivity to them, and 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 that the good guys win in the end. You know, I'm always I'm I'm big on that, and and so you know, I could see him going that way, but uh, I hope not. Yeah. I, it would just be different. I'm not you're, advocating for it. You're right. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> another one of mine is just uh, just to bring is, – is we started kind of talking about Melanie a little bit. I liked that like during her uh, narration at the beginning, she's already thinking of Snowpiercer and Big Alice as one train. Now, I, I know she does – toward the end of the episode, she kind of splits them up again. But you know, she does say that these are her revolutions, and I wasn't sure if she was meaning – her revolutions as in referring to Snowpiercer or her revolutions as in referring to Alex. I think she meant Alex. Okay. Okay. And she does. It, it might have even been a hint to that, that dream she had with the little girl. Mm-hmm. So it's like, was the little girl Alex or was that little girl Melanie when she was growing up? Because yeah. she was telling a story about her dad and when mm-hmm. she was growing up. So it's kind of one or the other. Yeah. Yeah. And she does say that Snowpiercer is now 1,034 cars long and we got that uh last week in Layton's narration he said snowpiercer 900 and something what did he say 994 cars 90, yeah. yeah 994 cars long and big alice 40 cars long so we have that now we have one train 1034 cars long and i i 
Yeah, and I've got it in my notes later, but I want to I'll bring it up now as as well. Is is I thought it was interesting when it's either Bennett or I think it's Javi actually who who brings up the point that they're they've really got to stay in sync with each other because the two trains have to run correctly because they could they could shake Snowpiercer apart, they could lag behind, mm -hmm. or like at one point Alex says we could slow Big Alice to a crawl and freeze you all out. And Melanie's like, well, if you did that, you would just have a you know a nine hundred car anchor basically for the rest of your days, you know. <laughs> but yeah, so it, it's really interesting. I, I like I like Melanie a lot, and I like the way Jennifer. Um, Connolly, she's you. great. Connolly, uh, yeah, Mrs. Paul Bettany is uh, is referring <laughs> is referring to it and playing this character. Uh, so, what's another one of yours? Along with in the beginning of that last episode in this ep episode, um, hope with all this horrible things mm -hmm. that you know the the hard to see scenes it says when she finds out there's a baby, mm -hmm. you know, baby on Snowpiercer. Um, that's hope, and then at the end, I think it's Melanie says the mission is hope. When yeah. the world comes alive again, yeah, and hope will. And Leighton also said, "Hope will unite them." Yeah, that's that was an interesting exchange between her and Alex, where right there at the end, where Alex is is telling her, "Don't tell me you're doing this for me," and she's like, "No, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for hope. I'm doing it for the the all for of all us. of us." You know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that that's a great that's a great one to pick out. We've already kind of talked about Kevin's death, but I, I it's kind of kind of sad that we lose this guy so early in in the season. Because he, you know, he's so proud of himself when he's talking about how important he is and all of his accomplishments from apprentice to now he's running hospitality on on Big Alice. And you know, I talked about Wilford as a cult leader, but really, definitely hospitality was his was his his cult, if you want to say his like cult disciples or or whatever, because they're spreading that word. And you know, even Ruth is is now kind of getting sucked back into it in a certain way when she's all excited about the community. Oh, a communique, and it's actually. Sleep by so Mr. Funny. Wilford's hand, you know. <laughs> she smells the paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and also, uh, Kevin, when he's describing hospitality mm -hmm. to Leighton and Roche, he calls it culture. Yeah. And it was just like call. Sure. Yeah. Cult. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But, you know, then he did give up all the information pretty quickly for some some chicken wings. And I'm curious. I don't know if you know the answer to this or not. Did Buffalo style wings really come from Buffalo, New York? I I don't know I if that's think true. So. They don't come from Buffalo. <laughs> I mean, well, you're right on that. I just thought it was it was it was interesting when Leighton was like a little taste of home for you. Some cayenne pepper mm -hmm. and some true Buffalo style. I had to, uh. to rewind it back to hear that Kevin was from Buffalo, was from New York. Buffalo. Yeah. So. Oh, and the way he attacked those wings. Oh my goodness. Incredible. Oh my goodness. Oh my yeah. Yeah. I loved it. I loved it absolutely. He attacked it like a man who's eaten nothing but spam. Yeah. Exactly. For and, seven years. And that's you know, and that's part of what what Wilford kind of tells him. Here's why you know you have to die because you you showed them our weakness. Yeah. You know, oh, you, definitely. You, you showed them that we're weak and we're lacking in food because of the way you you ate those wings and yeah. So wow. Uh, well, and he had to get Kevin out of there. I was surprised that they were going to exchange Mel right away mm -hmm. in this episode. But yeah, he he knew that Kevin was going to spill the beans all over the place, um, and he knew what was going to happen to Kevin as soon as he came back. But what a oh, weird way to do yeah. it. Very 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 creepy and weird. and and weird. All right. But even it, the whole thing was creepy and weird, but why did he get in the I, bathtub with I don't him? know. <laughs> the, <laughs> like, uh, the only reason I can think of is that, you know, some cult leaders, and I'm going to keep calling him that because I think that's really what he, some cult leaders are so into that persona that even they don't realize that it's a, it's, it's a, a front, uh, you know? Definitely no boundaries, which would also fit the definition of a uh -huh. cult leader exactly exactly very strange all right <laughs> uh moving on so what's another one of yours is get some more there yeah the one point i had after hope and the baby and this comes on later when we discover that someone's still alive mm -hmm. is that um uh, wilford is going after Leighton. he definitely wants to eliminate him as quickly as he can and i think that's revealed at the end too or a plan he had Mm -hmm. But Leighton has a baby, and that's a big vulnerability. But now Josie's alive. Yeah. So that's a vulnerability. And a big part of it is she has third-degree burns all over her body. <sighs> it's frostbite. And Wilfred has a way to heal that quickly oh, and completely. Oh, see. So he can hold that over his head or 
you know, will Leighton be thinking of that already? Once he starts, he yeah, once he starts getting information back mm-hmm. to, to him. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. And I, I wish I had rewatched season one to remember that whole, I know that, that Melanie was the one who locked her, locked Josie in the car mm-hmm. and, and kind of interrogated her. But then is it, was it Zara that was the one? Why did Zara let, let Josie die or, or tr- try to kill Josie in that car? Was there a reason? Was it just because, oh, because they were? she was with Leighton. Okay, that's that, that's what I was wondering. I, it's it's, it's yeah. coming back to me now, the whole love triangle thing, that she had to get mm-hmm. Josie out of the picture because because she wants Leighton for herself. So, mm-hmm. okay. Okay. All right. Now, I, now, I, now I'm back on track with that one. So, on track. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even know it. So let's see. Another one of mine. I've kind of talked about my points, but I, I thought it was interesting making Till the train, the train detective. I, I love that whole scene where uh, mm-hmm. Leighton walks in and he goes, Roche, let's do this thing. And Roche is like, already? <laughs> you know? And then they, like, she slaps <laughs> her hand on the book and says, you know, best Till, you are now the train detective. And, and uh, she's like, just like that? But wait a minute. I, I'm I just followed you around and he's like, you're ready for this. And then Roche, I love that line from Roche where he says, detective, that was a really beautiful ceremony. Beautiful ceremony. <laughs> you know? I know. Was, he he almost, is, he's great. He almost sounded sincere when he said it, but it, it really was interesting. And it was, it was great seeing her, her wheels kind of turn, you know, as mm-hmm. they give her the case of, of this, of lights having her hand cut. And then when she sees Wilford do that little three fingered salute mm-hmm. and she sees all the people, people doing it back at him and so she she goes to lights and she says i need you to show me your hand and we we discover that her thumb and pinky have been cut off so she's right. you know forever doing that wilford salute and so it, it it seems apparent that these there are cult there are members of this cult still on the snowpiercer mm-hmm. well and at first they thought it was just class clash you know they wanted to put a tail in her place right but this is also i think the first time we've seen the the three-figured W instead of the writing the W in the air across mm-hmm. your chest. Yes. I don't remember seeing that before. So it, I think it's, or it could be an indication of allies. I mean, they're all doing it, mm-hmm. but that is some kind of marker of, we got people here. Right. Or right. Like he has people on the train. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think so. And I think that, that would be interesting to see how that, how that's going to play out. Something I didn't bring up, and it was in my my uh, my top five actually that I thought was really touching. It was a very sweet scene. Was that moment between Bennett and Melanie when she comes back mm-hmm. on the train, and and he's looking at it, and she he sees her wounds, and and they just have this very tender moment. And I don't didn't remember in in the first season it seemed like it was more of a just a relationship out of circumstance they just happened to be the the two you know i don't know what javi's mm-hmm. deal was but you know there are <laughs> two people stuck in the engine and they just kind of found each other and you didn't i didn't really get a sense of relationship or love between them in the first I mean, did I, I just part of that though was mel's just her attitude was different when she had to hold it together mm-hmm. and be Wilford, you know, she was a whole lot more just hemmed in and didn't let her personality show. So maybe I think she just feels more free to just be herself. Right. Now she can kind of let her guard down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She can kind of let her guard down. She can, she can have those intimate moments with him and they don't have to hide it. So yeah, that, that could be, but I just, I just love that really that scene between the two of them. It was short, but it was, it was very powerful. And then of course she goes right into this was a third degree frostbite, you know, and you're like, uh-huh. oh, come on. Don't, you know, can you leave a tender moment alone? Um, so, <laughs> Isn't that a lyric? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So what else do we have here in, uh, in your notes? One of the other notes or thoughts, and I love it every time it comes up, is how they use science in the show. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they used real science. They don't uh, make a lot of it up, although a lot of it wouldn't work. Right. But, you know, we had Big Alice has some medical advancements and the frostbite treatment, uh, skin grafts and synthetic skin. Yeah. That enabled him to make that big old Frankenstein bodyguard. Mm -hmm. So they have been making some different kinds of uh, medical and scientific advancements. They don't have drawers. I don't think he's trying to perfect the, well, he's trying to perfect the human race, maybe in a different way. 
Uh, but I have yeah. a feeling he's doing it more like the third Rick did. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That was another one of those moments that Kevin kind of gave them some information. And I loved when, when they asked Kevin, well, how'd they do it? When he, he's talking about icy Bob and, and icy Kevin, Bob? <laughs> that's what, yeah, that's what they called him in the first episode. Oh, they called him icy Bob they, they, because when, when he says uh, he wants a protector for Alex, the, the guy says icy Bob or some other kind of Bob. And Wilford's like, who do you think, you know? Oh. <laughs> and, uh, and Forgot so, that. but yeah. And, and even Kevin calls him icy Bob. And he says his, his body has been, is able to resist the, the cold. And mm-hmm. they're like, well, how do they do that? And Kevin's like, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not <laughs> a like, doctor. I'm yeah, I'm hospitality. I don't know how they did that. They met, they somehow they, you know, did something to him, you know? So mm-hmm. I thought that, I thought that was great, but yeah, the, the whole talk about the, the CW seven and even, you know, that was one of those points where you could see at the end, you talked about the manipulation of Wilford is that, when they're talking about the science and then even the headwoods are like, yeah, that theory, that theory could work. That does sound that it could be a sound theory, but they're not, they're not going to confirm it because they don't want Wilford to kill him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they're they're definitely showing that, yeah, this could be true, but we'd have to get some more information. And that's when Melanie's talking about, well, we've got to put these balloons out and we got to get this research station up and running. And that's when I think Wilford even figured out, that Melanie was the only one who would be able to run this mm-hmm. research station. And so suddenly he sees a way, a crack. Again, one of those vulnerabilities you were talking about, maybe not a vulnerability of Leighton, but definitely a vulnerability of Snowpiercer. That that he can, if he can get Melanie out of there, right? You know, then he can start working his his cult leader kind of magic. Right. It's just one more roadblock out of the way, just like mm-hmm. getting rid of Leighton, you know. So yeah, I had some questions about that that research station. And boy, the look on Wilfred's face, mm-hmm. he does not want the world to come back alive. Uh-huh. He is. He is on top. So what's going to happen if people know they can get out? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, the only other note I have or, or number, I think I've covered all my numbers. And the only other note I have is, did, could you, did you figure out what was the purpose of Alex bleeding on the floor and then like slapping the wall with her bloody hand. Were they trying to map out the train maybe, or we can, uh, Um, I mean, I don't, I I think that, you know, cutting her hand was a reaction. I I don't think she was supposed to. I think she just grasped that razor so hard that it started to bleed. And did you notice what was happening the moment she, held it so tight that her hand started to bleed no that's what i what i missed out on both times i was okay. watching i couldn't figure it out it was when they were doing all the negotiation and uh-huh. i think they had decided mel was going to go to the station but wilford gets up and he's talking and he starts in on his big speech and all those things but he walks close to her and oh. he says, now because she kept working her way closer and closer to Leighton. And she smuggled that in for a reason. And she's looking around and there's a lot of noise and excitement. And he's real close to her and he just says, now. So she, I think, I think the plan was, is an assassination. That she was to get close to Leighton and kill him. And kill him with that razor. Mm -hmm. And when she didn't know, they didn't know she was going to have hope. Right. Somebody was going to bring up the world's coming alive. Yeah. So I just think the. She was reconsidering. I mean, it was an emotional reaction, I think, you know, just grasping it tight. But yeah, why she slapped it on the wall? Yeah, I don't know. Because she's a teenager (laughs) and she was mad? I I mean, it could be something simple like that. Yeah, I okay. Maybe maybe it'll come out later. But uh, yeah, I think that is all I have. And we've talked about everything else that that I've got uh, for the episode. Oh, you've got the song. You know what the song was that was on Alex's CD. Oh, yeah. When Wilfred says, uh, give us the room, mm-hmm. and they take their little bath together, she puts on the um, her headphones, and the CD is from 07, and the name of the song was This World. And one of the lyrics was, no, not in Noah or Noah's boat. So okay. they're not on the ark. They're definitely not on the ark. Right. And that was that kind of, you know, different science, different medical, mm-hmm. different um, goals on each train. Right. You know? Melanie's Snowpiercer was the art. Right. 
And right. she still wants to save humanity. And Wilfred's Big Alice is not yeah. the Ark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was meant to be like a supply, like a resupply train or something like that, I think is what they said in the in the first episode was was Big Alice was supposed to be when Snowpiercer needed resupply. She could mm-hmm. come out and they would connect and and then yeah, but what he's doing on that train is it, nothing oh, it's, like yeah, trying to, yeah. They changed mm-hmm. it. They retrofitted it. And uh, so what else have you got? Oh, well, I had the, the um, song. Mm-hmm. What was the other thing I had thought of? The, um, I am wondering about that research station. Right. I hadn't figured out that, well, yeah, it makes sense that, that Melanie was going on it. And I would imagine she's going to have someone else with her. Um, you would think she, she would need a team or a crew or something, you would right. think. But who knows? I mean, they they were up in the engine, just three of them. Yeah. But the research station is in the Rockies. Mm-hmm. And Big Alice took a shortcut through the Rockies. We right. know that because it was brought up before. So does Wilford know something about the station we don't? Does he have people there already? And is I wonder where they're doing their experiments. I wondered about that because I think did, it seemed like he seemed to stop the the head words when they started to say something when, mm-hmm. when she mentioned that station and he stopped them from saying anything so you you could be onto something there that he may already or they may have already picked that research station clean or mm-hmm. you know uh but i i tried to pick it up both times i watched to understand what the plan was that she was talking about and how they were going to manage to get back to that station you know um I guess there's a I guess there's more tracks than what we know about because mm-hmm. there's but it still takes a year to make a full circuit. So they're talking about getting her back in a month. So yeah. maybe Big Alice has a shorter route that goes in a big circle around the United States. That's I, I yeah I hope they I hope they reveal to us because I I never did figure out last season exactly what the route was that they were taking. We we get glimpses of it, mm-hmm. you know, when we see maps and stuff, but it it didn't. Um, it wasn't really clear, and I know in in oh. the in, in the movie it seemed like they were circumnavigating the globe. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they are in this in the okay. show too, but I don't think Big Alice is actually. No, no I, I don't think Big Alice is. I, so there mm-hmm. there must be other tracks still out there available that they can that they can. Uh, well, right, and one of his crew said that Big Alice could get in there and do something that you know, it's right. not a thousand cars long, so they could get through different passes and on different tracks that right. Snowpiercer can't. Right, right. Okay. Okay. So that's just going to be something more that we get revealed throughout the, the rest of the season. Yeah. Well, and there was just one little um, part with Wilford and his allies that I thought of mm-hmm. with, uh, in the movie, Wilford's in front and they have a radio. So he has the secret ally that nobody knew about. So right. I'm wondering if... His main ally on Snowpiercer is going to be someone we never expect. Right. Someone who's, who's you know, been in con- or who's going to be in contact with him could be interesting. That would be echoing the mm-hmm. the movie. Yeah. I mean, right, so. right. Okay. Well, I, I think if we've got all that, let's, uh, we've only got a few little quotes here. So why don't you uh, say yours and then I'll give mine? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. My quote, my favorite quote was when Alex is talking to, to Melanie. And she says that Wilford, this is what a quote that she gives from Wilford, that he said there are two different types of people in this world, dreamers and schemers. Dreamers can build the world up and schemers just slither along. Yeah. And I, I definitely think she was she was definitely pointing that directly at Melanie. So, um, Right. But who she thinks she is and who Wilford would consider, right. you know. Which of the two? Yeah, is, is kind of funny. Yeah, and I, I have another one of them from Alex as well. Is that uh, when they're when she's having that exchange with Melanie, and she says, "I think he says a lot when he's high." So, and we <laughs> yeah. do see him smoking smoking the the marijuana early in the episode uh, and stuff. So it's it's definitely there. And then uh, I love when when Till goes to visit the the pastor, and she's and she recognizes some of the religious artifacts, and he kind of raises an ar- an eyebrow, and she says, "My dad was." <clears throat> Jesusy, so <laughs> yeah, I like yeah. the way she put that. <laughs> Jesusy, yeah. So I didn't go back and look at feedback. So I hope uh, next week, if we have some feedback, I will will include it in here. Thank you very much. Do you have any podcast recommendations? Um, oh, well, we recommend our friends' podcast a whole lot. But I had someone who just started watching Game of Thrones. Oh, and I'm not sure everybody knows. 
that they can go back through Strange Indeed and find shows that have been covered in the past if you're mm -hmm. starting to watch something new. But we also have House Podcastica. So you can go back into the archives and find programs that maybe, you know, been long gone for years, but you want to listen and follow along. So, so just remember everyone, you can listen to what they're covering right now, but just like panels to pixels, you can go back and listen to the boys if you're just now watching it, you know, so that's my recommendation. If you've just now discovered the Punisher, our original, the, the original uh, podcast show that started us podcasting mark and i was the punisher on netflix and we mm -hmm. uh, you can go all the way back and, and hear our coverage of that so yes i i i just in fact someone just sent some feedback to strange indeed that they had gone back uh to one of their older shows and was was picking it up so that's uh, that's a great recommendation yeah i'll just echo the same thing you know check out next level network online check out how uh, podcastica.com the pirate core entertainment that's mark's network he's got he's got several podcasts on there that are that are going now and i uh, i send regular feedback into pake and daphne uh for their run for your lives podcast so i would definitely recommend those i'm gonna go through our feedback spiel real quick here um we can be heard on all your podcast players of choice so check us out there if there's a chance to give us a review give us a review you can also find us panels to pixels podcast.com our facebook page is facebook.com slash panels to pixels we have an email address panels to pixels one at gmail.com that's panels to pixels one the to spelled out right there in the middle and the number one at gmail.com we have a youtube page a youtube channel which is panels to pixels podcast uh so go out there give us a thumbs up you can subscribe uh, and check it out next week i will be back with another guest reviewing and, and talking about uh, episode three of Snowpiercer season two. Mark will be covering WandaVision. He will be recording for WandaVision episode episode five uh, on Monday night. He's going to be recording, I believe, with Paik and Jason. So you may have already, depending on how he puts these podcasts together, you may have already heard that or you may be about to hear it. And of course, thank you. Thank you so much, Kat. What else are you doing? Can, where else can our listeners hear you? Well, I'm just doing a little guest hosting, um, like here on Panels to Pixels. And uh, you mentioned Pyrocore Entertainment. I'll be doing a little something on Adrenaline Cinema and Run For Your Lives and having fun. Otherwise, if you guys want to listen to me, you just need to come out to Wisconsin and hang out on my farm. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes one of the reasons you can meet all sorts of interesting uh, i i messaged mark back and said farm life is weird <laughs> after you were delayed it's like farm life is weird yeah yeah goats don't know how to tell time of course you neither can, do guests <laughs> you can hear me right here and i send various voicemails to my friends podcasts as well so thanks everyone for listening i'm steve and i'm kat and this was Panels to Pixels, and we'll see you on the next panel. Good night. Good night.